and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Friday nights in Moetroof. This weekend is our education weekend. So our programs for, for this um, Sabbath will focus on education and young people. Um, before we kick off, I'd like to take this opportunity to um, introduce our speaker for this evening, which is um, Elder Maina Sindani Bloom, um, who will be taking us through the topic of um, principles of a successful and fulfilling life post-school. I will briefly give um, a biography of Elder um, Sandani Bloom before I hand over to her. Um, Mina Sandani Bloom attended many institutions of higher learning. She has followed many different career. She is now a life coach who empowers African Africans to identify and to change self-sabotaging behavior. She is, an, she is also an author of three books, which she has published. And those books are available. You can contact her directly. She loves to see people grow and develop. She loves teaching and teaching through her own experiences. She likes doing something new all the time. In 2021, she wants to pursue matters of peace education. She loves reading and keeping fit. She is one of the three elders of Mamelodi Central SDA Church. She wants to be known as a woman of prayer. She is married and has two children. On that note, um, I will open with a word of prayer. And after the prayer, we will then hear um, our guest speaker for tonight. Let's close our eyes. Dear Father who art in heaven, we thank you loving God for the blessed Sabbath that we have entered into. We thank you Father that you are with us throughout the day that you kept us safe. Lord, in these holy hours, we ask you to be with us, to speak to us, O oh Lord, starting um, from this moment, please be with Elder Sindani Bloom as she takes us through the presentation. Give her wisdom uh, uh, and give her knowledge that comes from above. This is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you, ma'am. Amen. Uh, Brother Lucky Pane and uh, Thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you to the church board for agreeing that I address the Muitluf Church. Um, I guess after lockdown, I will have time to come and visit you. Uh, the venue you are using is just over a kilometer from my house. So I can basically walk uh, to church. That will be, that will be lovely. Um, the topic that I was given is very interesting, um, and I did not know how to tackle it. Um, I was vacillating between giving an academic uh, presentation or giving a practical uh, presentation. So I decided on giving a practical uh, presentation, and that really is about what I did. I consider myself and I consider uh, my life uh, successful. I consider it happy, a, a happy one. And uh, when I look back, I realized there were certain things that I did that I think contributed to where I am. And I thought I would share them with young people and with parents, and then we can discuss. Um, you don't have to go through what I went through, uh, but I think the principles should be, should be the same. I won't talk for long. I like engaging more than uh, lecturing. So um, I'm going to share my screen. I'll go through the presentation that I've prepared 
And then uh, I think after 15 minutes or so, I should be done or 20 minutes at most. And then uh, what I'll basically do, uh, I will then, uh, we will then open the floor and allow uh, people to, to uh, give their own um, thing, to give their own uh, impression and ask questions. Uh, we tried this before, it worked. I'm trying to check where my presentation is. I have opened it. Uh, this is not what I want to share for now. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, whoa, where's my presentation? I had opened it. Woo! Anyway, um, let's do this. Can you see anything? Yes, we see it, but it's a it's a different it's presentation. presentation. It's an AMSCO presentation. Okay, yeah. a tester presentation is this one. Yeah, uh, that's the one. All right. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, okay, let's start. I do I do a bit of a marketing uh, spiel. Uh, I'm an author. I think uh, Brother Lucky has indicated uh, that when he started, this is the first book I wrote in 2010. And I wrote it because of my, the passion that I had and the observations that I had in my uh, coaching uh, experience, where I find that as, a, as African people, we tend to uh, use race as an excuse uh, to our detriment. Uh, race, yes, there is racism. I'm not going to deny that. But what I find is that the uh, solutions that we come up with uh, tend to disadvantage us. The second book that I wrote was uh, uh, just after that book. Basically, I'm saying as a nation, we are endowed with gifts, with talents, with skills. Uh, that uh, no other nation has. But unfortunately, we don't see that. And as a result, we don't realize we are bigger than the problem of racism. In fact, we shouldn't even be obsessed about it. Uh, but unfortunately, we are. So uh, the book addresses that. This one, uh, it, it came as a as a result of working in a defense environment for uh, over 10 years. And I realized there's so much technology. There is so much uh, that our children can get into. Uh, some of the technologies that we have and that we are enjoying, we don't realize that they actually come uh, from uh, defense technology. Uh, let me give an example. I think those who drive BMWs have a technology called the run flat tire. Uh, what happens is if you get a puncture, you can drive for something like 50 Ks uh, before you get, uh, you get help. That is a technology that comes from the military. Um, your drive throughs, you drive through to McDonald's, you drive through to Kentucky. Uh, it's a technology that comes from uh, the defense uh, uh, environment or from the military environment. What happened is that they felt that when there is war and soldiers are at war, they don't have time to get out of their cars and go and buy food. So they needed to stay in their cars with their weapons and buy food instead of getting out of the car. And so we are benefiting from that. Um, your tracker, your tracker is a military um, um, invention. Uh, military vehicles have had trackers for many years so that uh, the def the, their, their defense forces can actually track uh, where the car is. Something like a memory stick. A memory stick is a, is a defense or it's a military invention. What happened is um, before soldiers went to war, 
all their details were put in a memory stick, which was hung on, the, on their ne neck. Uh, if the soldier unfortunately dies, then they can take that memory stick, check it. They will know the name, they know who he is, they know relatives and all of that. So this is, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the third book that I wrote. It came in different iterations, sponsored by different companies. And the fourth one that I will be launching at the end of the year, it's an interesting one for me. I, I promised myself that I will write a book for my children before they leave home um, and, and dedicate it to them. Uh, but it, it's an interesting read for any child or any parent who, who, has, uh, who has children. 2022, uh, I'm, 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 and I'm publishing another one that I'm busy with. It really is about my, my spiritual uh, journey. So yeah, if you uh, want any of those books, uh, please uh, contact me. Now, this presentation, I'm basically acknowledging my parents and my grandparents, because that is the two sets of parents that, uh, that raised me. And you will see later why I'm dedicating this presentation to them. Uh, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. Uh, and it has a promise there. Uh, it also says the beginning of, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's what my, my parents taught me. And I decided to follow that without questioning it. And I think um, that old adage of respecting and honoring your parents still uh, works up till today. The fear of the Lord, I don't care what social media says, uh, it, still, it still is uh, uh, working. Now, where, where, does, where does your happiness start? Post-school? Uh, it's not going to start after school. It starts at home. Um, and I, I, I take it parents are listening. Young people are listening. The, the sort of beliefs we have in, at home, uh, our values, uh, the purpose that we have uh, is very unfortunate. This is a, a very passionate uh, field of mine where I would like people to know and understand their purpose and then craft a vision that will help them live that purpose. When you have those two things and you are clear about them, then you have a compass of your life and you will never go wrong. Many of us are, are created as chairs and we want to be tables. Some of us are created as tables and we want to be chairs. And we are always out of kilter and success or happiness eludes us because we are doing what we were not created for. The book of Jeremiah says, I knew you before uh, I put you in your mother's womb. You need to understand what that knowing means, what the purpose was that you were created for. Remember, sometimes I say to people, uh, if you think your life started in your mother's womb, uh, I'm sorry for you, because that's not, that's not where it started. That's a presentation for another day. What affects you post-school, how your parents relate to you, and how you relate to parents? This is, this is greatly important because uh, the primary relationships we have uh, as children as we grow up are with our parents. Uh, and if those primary relationships uh, are painful, if they are not good, if they are tumultuous, that means in the long run, uh, we're not going to be able to relate to other people, be it at work, be it our spouses, our friends, because the very primary relationship that was going to set a, a standard on how we relate has been damaged. I read three books uh, when I had children and at some stage I 
said to myself, if I had read these books before I had children, I probably would not have had children because of the immense responsibility that it puts upon you as a parent. They are all written by uh, our prophets, prophetess, Ellen G. White, Guide, Child Guidance, Mind, Character, and Personality, book one and book two. So do yourself a favor when you are a young person, uh, even before you think of getting married or having children, uh, think about reading these books so that you know what you are up to or what what you are getting yourself into right where does it also start i talked about the home uh career decisions uh, many of us and i see that a lot and it pains me children our children at high school they want to choose subjects that are easy because they want to pass at, uh, at metric they don't choose subjects uh, that will help them with their career choices. Uh, career specialists say that our children should have, should know what they are going to do or what career they are going to pursue when they are nine years of age. You would know many a times a child is at metric. You ask, what are you going to do after metric? Oh, I don't know. I'll see that's already a danger okay now uh it's very unfortunate that some of the careers that uh, our children choose uh actually they fail before they even qualify uh because uh, they will never find jobs neither will they be able to employ other people and I can never understand why, as parents, as African parents, we don't channel our children into creating jobs rather than looking for jobs. Because every single year, there are graduates that are produced by our universities, but they end up staying at home. So what are we looking at? You're looking at a career where you will employ people or at least you will be employable. Every single year, the Department of uh, Education, Higher Learning, uh, they produce a document of top 50 careers in this country. And fortunately or unfortunately, all 50 of them require mathematics as a subject at metric level, not math literacy, but pure mathematics. So if you don't take mathematics, it means you are taking yourself out of just over 100 careers. Over 100 careers will not be available to you if you don't take maths. I have an article, if you are interested, that I have written uh, it is entitled, Mathematics is Difficult. That is a costly superstition. There is no mathematics that is difficult. Perhaps the problem is how it is taught. Uh, parents, hear me out. When a child is between uh, seven and 10, at least let's say her primary, they are not scared of maths. They start getting scared of maths because of the schools we take them to, where other children tell them maths is difficult, teachers tell them maths is difficult, and teachers are not even able to teach maths. And as a result, children are afraid of mathematics, they don't take it, and they take all sorts of uh, uh, subjects uh, that are not going to help them uh, going forward. Let me give an example, very practical example. I have a nephew uh, who, when he did grade eight, he says to me, Mam Gulu, by pilot, okay, I'll help you. What I said to him, I said, 
start reading magazine about flying, about aviation. I gave him magazines. Start going into websites, understand the jargon, the language of aviation. Um, I exposed him to exhibitions where uh, aviation exhibitions. Uh, he's been in an aircraft. Um, I got him to attend the training program that is offered by the Defense Force for children who are interested in the aviation world. Uh, they give it for about uh, two weeks. Um, I organized that he goes to ATNS uh, at the airport where they actually are responsible for the landing and the flying um, and the takeoff of, of aircraft so that he can know. Uh, to cut this long story short, he did physical science and maths. Um, and then unfortunately he failed metric, but he understood the world of aviation like nobody's business. So he had applied at Vonner Boom uh, Flying School. And we went to them and told them that, no, this guy has failed his physical science and his maths, he hasn't done well. You know what the aviation school said? They said, no, we know this guy. This guy understands aviation. He loves it. We'll take him. He'll do aviation with us. He'll do his pilot, pilot ship. He can do his metric online. We'll help him. As I speak, uh, he started in January. As I speak, he has told me that he's going to start flying solo in a month's time. So what has happened? What has been the advantage? He understood what he, he wanted. He researched, he understood the jargon, he exposed himself. And that is what happens in the world of aviation where you see a lot of Europeans uh, piloting aircrafts and you think they are cleverer than you. They are not. They simply get exposed at an early age. And by the time they finish metric, they know exactly what is flying, what is aviation, the parts of the aircraft, they know all the rules, all the physics that, that's involved. Now, if you are just going to say, I want to be a pilot and you start talking that language after metric, that you look like you are behind and they, they will be far ahead of you. So that's, that's just one example. I mean, if a child um, um, chooses his career at nine, they might not necessarily follow that career, but expose them to that career. And once they get exposed to it, they will either love it or decide, no, 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 I, I did not think this is what it is. Let me try something else. So that by the time they do grade uh, 10, where they have to choose the subject, they should choose relevant subjects to, the, to their career of choice. Also subject choices, I said earlier, uh, our children tend to choose easy subjects and not subjects that will help them uh, with, the, with, with going forward uh, with their career. And I'm sure you know a book. If you don't, let me know. I'll get a, a consignment of books for your young people. It was uh, written by our personal ministries director at the division, Pastor Nguaru where he actually shows that uh, high school decisions or decisions that we take when we are at high school affect the rest of our lives. So high school is a very, very crucial time uh, for you to make decisions that are for your success and for your happiness or against your happiness and against your success. What I did, uh, this is now the practical part. I'm just talking about myself, what I did. I'm sure there's something you can take from there and then we can discuss or you can add or you can ask questions. I obeyed my children. My, I obeyed my parents, all right? Uh, out of all my parents, my, my grandfather was my greatest influencer. Um, my grandmother taught me unconditional love my mother was rough and streetwise. I've got that uh, in me as well. My dad, ever loving, never lifted a hand. And he taught me handy life lessons. 
Mr. Ntulangosi, I'm sure you are familiar with him. He was my Sabbath school uh, class teacher and he cultivated a love for reading for me. And I found church was a school and school was fun. Um, I went to school and these are my grandfather's teachings. He checked my homework. Remember, if I didn't tell you, my grandfather does not know how, did not know how a classroom looked like. He saw a school building from far. He never was in that building. I think he just had God given wisdom. Uh, and he taught me that when I have my own children, there must always be someone at home to welcome the children. I never opened the house door when I came back from school. There was always somebody at home, either my uncle or my mom or my grandfather, or my grandfather taught me how to cook, how to iron, how to clean the house, how to wash the car, mow the lawn, trim the grass, cut the fence tree and prune trees. That was my grandfather. What do we do as parents? Many a times we spoil our children. We mollycoddle them. Some of them can't even fry an egg for themselves. Some of them can't even make a, do a basic chore like making their own beds or cleaning their room or cleaning uh, the bathroom, cleaning the kitchen. Um, and some we teach them, uh, we teach them to just watch TV and the auntie does everything. And then we wonder when they have their own homes, they are going to fight uh, with their husbands or their wives because they feel that uh, they can't do house chores. House chores are for an auntie. And at that time, they might not even be able to afford domestic help and uh, you don't want to see how the house will look like. Uh, my grandfather taught me what careers I should pursue. Unfortunately, on this one, I did not follow him. Listen to what my grandfather wanted me to be. I think he was ahead of his time. He wanted me to be a, 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 an owner of a construction company. Ooh. Had I listened to him, I don't know, I probably would have been better off, I don't know. But I didn't go that way. And he gave me another option and he says, you can also be a dentist. I didn't pursue that. Uh, but uh, here I am, I pursued other things that I, I love. Um, and he taught me how to save money. He used to love a Zulu saying, that says, Imali isengondweni. What he meant by that, he says to me, my child, a person can earn 50,000 rands a month, but if Arana Ngondo, that 50,000 will just dissipate. You can earn 5,000 and you can have more money than, than him. Ah, he was teaching me stewardship. Um, he taught me the criteria I should use to find a husband. And listen to this one. He said to me, uh, my child, you know, the way I see things going forward, uh, there's going to be problems in many marriages. One of the problems is uh, raising a hand for, for women. Go and do a self-defense course for yourself. If you have a husband who will want to lift his hand then you show him a thing or two and he'll never touch you again. Uh, little did I know that my grandfather was prophetic. Uh, I don't need to tell you about uh, the many stories that we hear about what is called gender-based violence. What did he say to me? My grandfather says to me, my child never stay in a shack. I asked him why. He says, listen, uh, shacks are created by white men for black people so that they must not think beyond the shack. When it rains, you worry about water dripping into your shack. When it's hot, you worry about the heat. When it's cold, you worry about cold. 
and you can never think beyond your shake. When I did my first year nursing, I was taught about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Little did I know that my grandfather knew about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He just didn't call them that, but he understood them. That is godly wisdom. And he said to me, work towards financial independence. Many of our children, when they get the first income, they want to open an account to go buy clothes. When they have good money, they the first thing they want to buy is a car instead of a house. A car depreciates, a house appreciates, right? Here is what my grandfather taught me again. He says, run away from a man who flaunts money. He will never take care of you. He's just a boaster. He doesn't have money. He says, if any man comes to you and wants to marry you, ask him what his ambition is in life. That's how he put it. Ask him how much money he has in the bank. Make sure that he loves you before you marry him. Interrogate him in and out. And that is what I did with my husband. He says, check his relationship with his mother. If he respects and honors his mother, oh, go for him because he will respect and honor you. If he doesn't, run. And he says, if you decide to marry a man who has children, make sure he supports his children. If he doesn't, run. Because if he doesn't support his own blood, how is he going to support you when you are not related to him? He also said, don't get married early. Explore the world. Enjoy your youth. And he, he had a special meeting with me uh, in my last year at college. He says to me, I want to make a plea. Please don't come and stay with me. Don't go and stay with your parents. Go and live alone. Even if you stay in a flat or in a bedroom, I asked him, granddad, why? He says, you are going to be uh, sharper and clever and independent. You will know how to use your money. You won't rely on me. You won't rely on your parents. And I thank him greatly for that. He says, manners are better than money says to me, if one day you have power, my child, use it to protect and not to abuse. Those were beautiful lessons that uh, my grandfather taught me, including my dad. My dad says to me, my daughter, if any man raises a hand for you, he is not worthy of your love. You must just take a U-turn and walk, never look back walk away from an abuser, he will never stop abusing you. My father cooked for us, he baked for us. He said, cooking, baking are not gender roles. They are life skills. Nothing outside you defines you, all right? Anything that defines you is that which comes from within. He says, don't waste food. There are so many people who go hungry. He says, for me, when I died, and he died this year in February, may his soul rest in peace. He says, instead of giving me a dignified and expensive funeral, when I cannot see, when I cannot thank you, be with me now, do whatever you want to do for me when I'm still alive. You can bury me with the cheapest coffin I would not care, but you, you would have loved me when I was still alive. Respect the elderly, respect children as well. Love your family, work hard. He said, stop depending on government for your livelihood, depend on your hard work. He says, dependency on others make you stupid. He then says to me, stop envying other people's things. <laughs> Because when you are envious of other people's things, 
you will be a thief. And that's one of the laws in the Bible, thou shall not covet. Rather, um, what did he also say? He says to me, I, I spoke about never staying at home. And my life post school, college, oh, it was beautiful. I explored everything. I went into nursing college. I did my basic nursing. I did my midwifery. I have delivered many, many babies to come on this earth. Uh, when I was in PE, I lived on my own for over 15 years in my own flat, studied with UNISA. I developed myself in many areas, explored many different careers, traveled, um, and look at some of the professions I, I pursued. I was a nurse, I left, I became a reporter, I worked for parliament for three years, I left, I became a public affairs manager at AMSCO, got promotion, did corporate communications, I left corporate, I went on my own, became a life coach. In the process, I discovered I can actually be an author. Um, and then because I realized that there's a problem in the African camp about maths, I started exploring uh, maths and uh, I am busy studying it uh, so that I can teach uh, children. And maths uh, together with piano, they actually, it has been researched. I've got many, many um, uh, research papers that I read that the combination of the two actually opens new neural paths in, a, in, in any brain, whether that of an adult or of, 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 of a child. Math is not as difficult as it is meant to be. Try it as a young person and you'll never regret. Let me give you an example. We are into a lockdown. There's COVID-19. I don't need to tell you. Just look at the people who give us information, the, the people who are behind the scene, who do research. How many of our African people are there? Very few. Um, all over the world, you actually see uh, Indians, uh, even here in this country, they are in the forefront in as far as uh, the, 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 the pandemic of COVID-19 is. Cause that's an area that uh, they pursued, all right? Um, I, I participated. You know, many of us, when we are given an opportunity to participate, we want to refuse. Participate, make mistakes, it's fine. What's going to happen is you are going to learn and you will find what young people say, your mojo, you'll find what resonates uh, 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 with you. I've done interpretation, I've done translation. I spoke about cooking. I'm a fitness fan. I, uh, I like uh, uh, driving, I like cleaning. All right, is my life successful? Is it fulfilling? You know the answer. I'll stop there. Uh, let us ask questions and let us discuss. Over to you, uh, Lucky. I, I, do have, I do have a list of the top 50 careers in South Africa. I will send it to Lucky and then he can share it with the members of the church. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mama, for such uh, a wonderful presentation. A, a presentation actually that draws lessons um, from the people who've been influential in, in your life. Um, it, it's, it's quite in, inspiring. I think I will kick off. Um, I'll kick off with a question and then open it up to, to those um, that also have questions. You can either raise the question, or rather you can raise your digital hand and I'll give you an opportunity to ask your question, or you can also then um, put it through on the chat box and then I'll read it out to, 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 to everyone else. We'll also then just check 
on our other platforms, our streaming platforms, if there are any questions coming from there. Mama, you followed different careers. I just wanted to ask you, um, how easy was it to transition from one career to the next? Um, and how do you go about it? Because I mean, it can be, it can be quite difficult because most of the time people look at your current experience whenever then they consider you for a potential position. So how did, how did you make that transition to, to different careers? I think that's the first question as we then await um, other questions from, from the floor. Uh, remember, what, one of the things that we tend to undermine, and maybe we undermine because of how we are taught about this God that we believe in. Um, we tend to concentrate more on religion, religious uh, rituals, instead of having a relationship uh, with your creator. Some of the things that happened in my life, I have no explanation for. Uh, I can only see uh, the hand of God in, in, in it. Let me, let me give you an example. When I, I finished uh, uh, as a nurse, I, I, I finished my training, I started working. I did occupational health and I wanted to work in industries. At that time, they didn't allow um, African nurses to work in that space. And I decided, look, I want to go into corporate and study it with UNISA. And I applied for a job in parliament. And uh, to cut a long story short, I went there um, and I was taken. Later, the person who interviewed me actually uh, told me a secret that he wasn't supposed to tell me. He says to me, um, you were not one of the candidates that were taken because the question was, but this person is a nurse. How does she know issues of reporting in, in parliament? And he says there was a big debate and the only reason I won, they said, look, this must be a hard worker. If she can be a nurse and study with UNISA part-time and get her degree, then she can do anything. And that's how I got into that. But also, um, I think the influence that my grandfather had uh, on me, he, he, he just instilled a certain sense of curiosity. Uh, I, I'm always curious about things. And uh, I, I, just, I just go and explore them. And in the process, I've discovered that actually as human beings, and that's my discovery. You can challenge me on that. As human beings, we are multi-talented. You can do anything that you set your mind on to do. I hope that answers you. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, there are quite a number of comments that have come through the chat. Um, just, I think a lot of them. So Akona says, I think you spoke about that your, your grandfather taught you the importance of money and saving. So Akona is saying that, and obviously that the potential partner uh, needs to be someone who does not flaunt their money because they don't have, if they flaunt it, they don't have. Yeah. So Akona is saying um, six months bank statement, proof of savings and investments it's I just a comment. It's just a comment with from, <laughs> from a corner. Um, she also then just quotes you on if you've got power, use it to protect and not to abuse. I think those are some of the comments. Others are just wowed uh, by some of the content in your presentation. And I suppose it's um, they're actually concurring with what you are saying. Mama, a number of our um, younger people who are still ambassadors or those that are still in high school joined yeah. us slightly after you had started. Um, and perhaps maybe on the importance of math. So 
if, if a child is already struggling, let's say the foundation was not right from a meds perspective, uh, what, how do we assist them to ensure that they don't um, block themselves out from the many careers that are there um, that do need meds? Because the reality is once kids get to high school, they, they really run away from meds. And the issue is the foundation. So what do we do uh, to try and correct for that? once it's a bit too late? Or we uh, catch that the problem is a bit late? Um, with, with, I don't know. Uh, in life, uh, lucky. Before I answer that question, before I forget, uh, there's somebody who is SM. This SM probably knows me. Uh, he or she says we are grateful to Ubaba and Umamu oh. for the valuable lessons. Those are my grandparents. <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> I, I need to greet that person. SM. All right, we can talk after this. Yeah. Okay, look, uh, there's nothing called too late. And, and that's, where, that's where the problem is. Sometimes I, I always am critical of Christians like myself. Um, I don't know how we read the scriptures and I don't know how we understand it. Is there something in scripture that it's too late and you can't go back, you can't uh, redeem yourself, you can't fix things for yourself? There is nothing like that. Now, here is what I have discovered in meds. I, I personally uh, went and registered last year with a school and, and I did my research and I was, I was told that your, one of your best uh, meds systems is the Kumon system, all right? I went to register and just to understand, you know where I started? I started with grade one. One plus three is four, three plus four is seven, uh, five times six is 13, nine times uh, five is 45. Those are your basics in maths. And every time I went to a higher uh, uh, level, when I get stuck, they take me back to a lower level because the issue mm -hmm. is you probably missed uh, something, something there. Uh, and so you go up. And once you are competent here, you go up. Once you are up and you're struggling, you come down until you master what is here. And then you go up. The, you, cannot, you cannot go wrong. And I'm, I'm, now, I'm now doing a grade nine maths. Okay, I've done my maths at metric, but I, I just wanted to understand where our children are having mm -hmm. a problem. And if I can, if I can, if I can make it, <laughs> any child here can make it. And what, what I've done, I've, I've also partnered with a, a, a wonderful gentleman uh, who actually takes maths and show you the practicality of math. And because I think that is one of the biggest yeah. problems that our children have, they say X plus Y equals to two A. Well, what is that? How is that going to help me? And he takes that and actually shows uh, how practical maths is in our day to day. Let me give an example. European children are taught, if I have three sheep and Buzz John has eight sheep, how many sheep are there in total? They say 11. Mm. Our kids, they say to them, what is eight plus three? They say it's 11. And they say to them, I've got eight rands and three rands. If I combine them, how much are they? Then the child can speak. 
So you, you understand that it's such a small thing, yet it yeah. makes a huge difference because yeah. then they can't relate with what, what, what they are doing. As a result, then meds just become one of those things mm. and mm. it doesn't look like it is useful. All right. Yeah. You're going to need meds to do a lot of things. For example, when I, we took my, knee, my nephew to pilot school, do you know that there's a chronic shortage of about 2,800 pilots across the world? Sure. So young people are here. You, you can go and be a pilot. You will never be without a job, okay? COVID, fine, it will pass. Uh, but there is a constant shortage of pilots, mm -hmm. okay? There's a constant, many of our roads are done by other people. They have to import people to come and do roads and we're sitting here and, and, and not even, you know, interested in doing, in doing such a job. Remember, those people are also human beings. There is nothing that they have that you don't have. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thanks mama for that. I'm going to read two comments and then I'll just hand over to a corner who has a question. Uh, Prof Kanyani says, South Africa is in shortage of artisans and young ones should be exposed at an early career to, to increase such opportunities and should also be adaptable to fourth industrial revolution pathways. That's the first comment from Prof. Um, I think you'll respond, but before you respond, I'll also just read out a comment from uh, Lebum Hambi. Thank you for an informative session. In terms of exposure and resources in the family, how can we support young people who lack these resources? Lack of exposure, not supported by their parents due to different family dynamics or socioeconomic outcome, socioeconomic status. Okay. I yeah. think maybe mama, you can respond to those two comments and then we'll take a corner's question after. That's fine. Look, here, here, here is a, a forum already. Uh, I've already exposed myself to what I do. Uh, maybe some young person may be interested in one of the things I've done already I should be a mentor. Um, a, a church like Moikluf can have um, a group of mentors where they'll mentor these young people. Where the young person needs a skill that none of you have, I'm sure you can find it somewhere else. Yeah. That, that, should be, that should be the support that the church should give. Um, the, the people who are responsible for education in the church, uh, let, let, let us go beyond having an education day in the church when you are an education director. Let us look at the needs uh, of, of our children and help them with it. I'm sure uh, with the caliber of people that you are in the church, I'm sure you can help all your children that are there. Um, they just have to ask, you just have to also ask and, and, and check. And what Professor Kanyani is saying is, is very crucial. Uh, it is very unfortunate that we have been uh, taught that education is wearing a suit and a tie. And many of us have suits and ties with CVs and no employment. I can ask any of you, uh, many of you live in suburbia. If you call out a plumber to come and uh, uh, fix maybe a leak or anything that has to do with plumbing, how much do they charge you per hour? If you are lucky, they'll charge you 800 rands and they'll tell you if I work more than an hour, it will be so much uh, per hour. And uh, so a plumber can, can, can fix whatever problem in your house for an hour and a half or two hours, and they charge you a thousand seven, a thousand eight. Okay, he'll be having an over blue overall and uh, safety boots, but he'll be eating. You'll be having a suit 
with a CV, with no job, and high English, all right? Uh, on the list that I've, I've given you, the, the, I think the last 15 careers have to do with artisanship, all right? I, in the book that I've written of defense technology, I interviewed an engineer. He says to me, um, we actually need more artisans than we need at, uh, uh, engineers. Engineers just talk, uh, artisans do. So if we have more engineers, remember when you're looking at uh, 4IR, what's going to happen? Uh, we are looking for robots that are going to do certain things. Those robots are going to have to be built by artisans, not engineers. And what, what happens? Engineers and, and artisans are like this. You know, when somebody has to build your house, you need an architecture to write a plan. That's what the engineer does. But you are going to need the actual builder to build the house according to the specifications of the engineer. And those are your builders. Those are your construction uh, 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 companies. Um, uh, I, I don't need to tell you that uh, IT is probably the fastest growing profession in the world. We're sitting here talking to each other because of Zoom. Um, two weeks ago, I was listening to an economist saying Zoom has made something like 355% profit. Can you imagine what, what, that, what that means? 355% profit. Wow. You got to look. Yeah. Okay. All right. Akona, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Mama, you are veering off the screen. Oh, Can sorry, you sorry, just sorry, sorry. come to your... Okay. Am okay, I fine now? now? you are perfect. <laughs> okay, sorry. Akona? Yes, you are fine now. Oh, okay. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mama, for this beautiful presentation. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, I just wanted to ask, based on um, your transition from um, college, after college and moving into um, work life and to just find out if you personally felt any pressure at any given point, especially during that time, because you mentioned that you lived by yourself for like 15 years. So I'm assuming like you were just focused on your life because that came out um, uh, quite a lot in your presentation and, and just um, focusing on your dreams and your aspirations and what you wanted to do as an individual. And my question now is on the pressures because in our time, I don't know about your time during your time, but in our time, there's just so much pressure going around. Um, I guess because we also have social media where you, you see a lot of people successful and i'm saying successful like in inverted commas because being successful or success is is really relative but there's just so much that certain there are certain people whether it's outside or inside that you should have this by now and you, sometimes you listen to these sometimes they are pressures that you give yourself because it's internal voices you listen to them you're like no really i'm like 32 by now i should have this this and that because that was what I had envisioned as a teenager, maybe, or as, 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 as someone in my early, um, early 20s. So I just wanted to know if you ever went through that stage. Um, and if you did, how did you overcome that? And also, um, if you didn't, like, what advice would you give to um, the youth of today? Because I may be in a space where I know, like, personally for me, at least I can, whenever I go back, like, to my parents, to home, like, to home, I know that they are, like, my sounding board, and I remember their teachings and the lessons and the way that I was raised. Then I can always remember that, okay, it's not about that, and the fact that I have a relationship with God. But we are also surrounded by so much more than, ourselves and what we do and 
sometimes you just feel like I'm not doing enough. Like I have goals. So did you ever feel like you were putting pressure yourself, um, like pressure on yourself to, to achieve certain goals within a certain time frame, um, or other people had time frames for you to achieve certain goals and so forth? Uh, thank you, Akona. Good, good, good question. Uh, pressures were there, and I'll tell you some of the pressures that I went through and how I managed to um, deal with them. Uh, I see Elder Maimela is, there, is here. Uh, I, I hope I'm allowed to call a spade a spade and not a garden tool. Uh, and I, I should not be reported to the conference. You know, they can uh, uh, take a clip of mine and send it to the conference and I get a letter from uh, <laughs> President Shongwe. I hope that's not gonna happen. Um, let, me, let me say one pressure I, I had, but I did not feel because I had a very supportive family I am born first at home. And I've got three sisters that come after me. They all got married before I got married. And when I visited my mother in Soshanguve, people were asking, are you Messin Dani's last born? They were making a mockery <laughs> of me. Uh, because traditionally, uh, it's the firstborn who should lead the way. But I, I had my sight on other things. I, I said to my sisters, look, if you want to get married, go ahead. Don't wait for me. I've got other plans. Marriage will find me, but I'm, going, I'm not going to go around looking uh, for it. And then one day we had a family lunch and my uncle came to me. I don't know what my uncle saw. Uh, and he had a private chat with me. That's my mother's younger brother. He says, uh, don't worry, man. Marriage is nothing. Leave them to get married, man. You you will get married uh, uh, at your own time. Don't 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 worry. We are not worried about you. So you you can get those kinds of um, of pressure, and uh, if you succumb to it, you end up marrying the wrong guy. And the very people who you were succumbing to the to your pressure, they will not be there. To, to get on to, to, to help you. The other issue is uh, money. Remember what happens is, at least the era I grew up uh, in, uh, my parents were struggling and I couldn't, I couldn't just go and enjoy my life when there are struggles at home. So the money I was earning at nursing, I had to share with my parents and with my, with my siblings. Do I regret doing that? No, it's a commandment that I got uh, from the Bible, which says I need to care for my family. Unfortunately, today's children are calling it black text. I never felt I, I was text, but we just found ourselves in a situation where I couldn't go and drive a beautiful car when I know my parents don't even have a decent food uh, to eat. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. So I, 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 I had to stop. In the workplace, uh, of course you will find uh, racism and you find it subtle, uh, but uh, you can find it very glaring. Let me tell you a very wonderful experience. When I was doing my nursing, uh, there was a, a, a tall, poor lady uh, in our dining room. When we came back from the wards to go eat before we go to a, a nursing home to sleep, she would mock us and tell us in Afrikaans and say, even if you can study, that's not going to help you. May, may hrat as may fail. He says, my skin is my degree. All right. When I left, uh, when I finished nursing, I went to look for a job at a clinic called Astrid. It is now called Mulemet in Pretoria. When I arrived there, the receptionist 
uh, chased me away. There was a board that says no vacancies, only for nursing. I came with my certificates and I said to, he, to her, call the matron. She looked at me from head to toe and said to me, you can never be a registered nurse, go away. I said, no, call the matron. I have my certificates, here they are. She said to me in Afrikaans, I insisted she called the security to get me out of the hospital and I had to leave. But when I look back, I thank her <laughs> because I then went to Joburg, which was more advanced and got uh, more exposure. The other, the other pressure that I found is that, uh, and this is very unfortunate, our church teaches certain things, but our leaders and our members do different things. You would find that when you come out of matric, when you come out of college, you will have, a, when you are a, a young lady, you will have men chasing after you, even those that are married. Let me tell you a story. Uh, young girls, listen to me properly. A man will come to you, you know, my baby, I love you so much. You say to him, uh, no, but you have a wife. No, you know what? Uh, my parents forced me to marry her. I don't love her. And we don't even sleep in the same room. I actually love you. Do you believe such things? They are conning you. All right? Um, they, say, they say things when they are standing in the pulpits mm. and they do something different outside of the pulpit. As if Christianity is a blanket that you can put on and off uh, as you wish. So those are some of the pressures uh, uh, that you will get. I, I had a marriage, my first marriage offer, I was 17. And I refused it because I felt I was just too young. I didn't know anything. And I spoke to my grandfather about it. He said to me, run. And I did that. He, he advised me not to get married early because it takes time for one uh, to grow. Things that I believed in when I was 16, I didn't believe in when I was 30. Things that I may not have believed in when I was 16, I began to believe in when I was 30 because life has a way of, of, of teaching me other things. So yeah, those are some of the, 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 the pressures that uh, you, you, have, you have to deal uh, with and ethical issues. Uh, your generation is even worse. I mean, I often hear of stories where you have to do a floor interview uh, before you get, you get a job. Um, if you don't, sorry, uh, next, uh, it will be given uh, to somebody who's willing uh, to do a floor interview. And as a result, uh, you find that uh, in a lot of jobs uh, within the state and within parastatals, you have a lot of incompetent people there. And those who are competent to run those positions are sitting outside because of corruption and the thievery uh, of, of people. And that is why our education system says you just don't educate one aspect of, of, of one's life, but it is the spiritual, it is the mental, also the physical. Because let me tell you what happens. We can, we can train doctors, but doctors can claim from the medical aid for procedures that they did not do. That I know of doctors who, would, who a, a, a person wants money to, to, um, to take his or his children to university. And the doctor claims for a procedure that he did not do, maybe a procedure of 100,000, 120. The medical aid pays the doctor and they share the money with this person so that he can take uh, his children to university. Is that the education uh, that we need? Hmm? Lawyers will get... Uh, uh, trust funds 
and chow those trust funds and drive with the uh, uh, Porsche cars and our young people will look at them and, and aspire to emulate them without knowing that they are thieves. Those cars were bought with stolen money, money that should have helped the poor. Is that the education that we want? No, no, no. And so when my grandfather said, when I look at your car and envy it and know that where I am, I'm not going to be able to afford it. I'm going to find ways. And many a times it's crooked ways to get money for me to be able to drive that car so I can be seen. I hope I answer you, Akona. Yes, um, I think you, yeah, you've covered that in quite detail. We need to wrap up now, Mama. I'm going to read one more question from the chat box. I would have also liked um, our ambassadors to actually ask questions. We've got Loazi Karabo, we've got um, Sisandi So, Guys, I would not want us to close this session without you asking your question. So I'm going to read one more question. If, the, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll give you the platform. Uh, Mama, the question is from Baneli. How do you change the mindset of, a, of young people, especially when they are convinced that maths is difficult? So how do we change the mindset uh, around mathematics? Uh, yo, it's a difficult one, but that becomes a parental role. Uh, remember the Bible says, train up a child in the way it should go. When you tend to teach them at a young and early age, uh, you might not pick up uh, those problems. Uh, but what I'm saying, remember, what I'm, sa I'm not saying force your children to do that. I'm just showing you the advantages of, of, of doing maths. Your, your child might want to be an artist. Allow them to do that. It probably be the best artist that the world has ever seen because that is his purpose and that is uh, within him. Uh, but, but maths is really, really not difficult. And for you to convince children, you've got to convince them when they are still at primary. Once they go to high school and listen to their friends, it, it can almost be difficult. Um, and our teachers are also not helpful because many of them don't know how to teach it, but they also believe it is, uh, it is difficult. Yeah. Okay, so everything starts at home. If you look at my presentation, I said, where does it start? I said, what? Home. At home. Professor Professor Ganyani is, the, is here. He can attest to you. I think three years ago, we were in Bloemfontein. I said to him, Professor, 2020, I'm taking a sabbatical. He says, why? I said, no, my daughter will be doing metric. I want to be with her, support her, make sure she's well supported and she gets what she, what she wants so that at least she could have a, a, a good base. Uh, before going to tertiary, uh, to college. Little did I know that we will have COVID and I would have taken <laughs> a sabbatical <laughs> anyway. Uh, that, that's very interesting. It, it, speaks to, it speaks to goal setting as well, that you can set a goal and um, you know everything else works together to make sure that you achieve your goal. Lucky, here, here's an offer I can make. Uh, we, can, we can have a different Zoom meeting, maybe during the course of the week, for the ambassadors uh, yeah. alone, without their parents, uh, and we can talk. I know okay. sometimes there could, be, there could be issues and they may not be able to, to come out. I'm happy to do that. Uh, you can check how many ambassadors are there, uh, how many young people are there, and then we can have our own Zoom meeting yeah. Uh, and then we can discuss some of these things in detail. All right, uh, we'll definitely uh, take you up on that, Mama. Um, we've come to the end of, of tonight's session. 
But let me just then echo the words of Ubabalwa who says, thank you for thank you for the presentation, such beautiful teachings from your grandfather and father. And then Usfiso touches on one of the something that you mentioned around black text. He actually quotes First Timothy chapter five, verse eight. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. On yeah. that note, Mama, um, I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank you for the presentation and also how you managed to actually cover both those that are still in school, but also the more senior people. I think it was, it was applicable to, to, to both groups. So a job well done on, on, on that. And we really, really appreciate the time that you've taken to spend this, this evening with us. I'm going to request um, our elder to please close this session for us with a word of prayer. Elder Maimela. And uh, it reminds me the days when we were doing master guide and you were teaching us communication. And I have always known you to be a great communicator. But um, the sight of you that I've seen today is just amazing. May the Lord richly bless you in your ministry and, you. um, and continue to serve him in this capacity. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? Our great God in heaven, it is always a privilege to sit at the feet of our Lord and to be blessed by his presence. Thank you for having used your servant in a very special way. To unpack the sciences of life and the sciences of salvation at the same time. So we got best of both worlds today. We pray for a special blessing upon her as she continues to serve you in this capacity. We are grateful, Lord, that we could gather around and uh, worship you in the beauty of holiness. So, Lord, we are grateful of the Sabbath and your choicest of blessings that you have prepared for your people on this, your Sabbath day. So we surrender our lives unto you afresh. Keep us safe, as you can only do. Forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness mm. and protect us from all evil. This is our prayer in Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Bye-bye. Amen. Bye-bye so and happy Thank Sabbath. You. Mama will talk then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Anna bye, bye, Bella. And happy Say Sabbath. hi to Lumonde. I will. Bye. Thank you. And Sifiso, hi, Sifiso Mukale is my younger brother. <laughs> I appreciate it. So who's this SM? It's him. Yes, I see. Oh, SM oh, is him. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. All right. Uh, bye -bye. Let's start. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Pooms, please stop the streaming. <laughs>